Now, since we're dealing with play, our next step is, uh, there are two steps now to follow. We've got some more theoretical matter to go through, and after that we get into nonverbal practical matter. But I want to talk about music for a while. Do you realize that music could be defined as the greatest vice and addiction in the country? It's a colossal industry. People are utterly dependent on it. Lots of people can't do without music at all. I billions of dollars go into the making of records, into the artistry of uh, playing instruments and all this kind of thing and it's completely and utterly useless from a practical point of view everybody gets excited about people being alcoholics being uh, heroin addicts <laughs> being uh, marijuana smokers being uh, this that and the other but you could say there is a disease called corditis and that corditis is addiction to uh, melodious noise. That's absolutely fascinating. Because uh, when people, they go to these concerts, you know, where most elaborate productions are put on, and then compulsively they have to, to clap <laughs> when it's over. You see, they're complete idiots. <laughs> And herein lies one of the great mysteries of being. Because music, like survival, doesn't really have to happen. Now let's look, you see, therefore, take music as a model of the universe. Music is a fantasy with no destination. Dancing is the same thing, only in motion. And when we dance, we are not going anywhere, except round and round. And the universe, according to the Hindu theories, is going round and round, but according to St. Augustine of Hippo, the universe is going along in a straight line. And this was one of the most disastrous ideas that was ever visited upon <laughs> Western civilization. St. Augustine said, if, the t if time is cyclic, Jesus Christ would have to be crucified again and again. And there would not be, therefore, that one perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And therefore, time had to be a straight line. From the creation to the consummation, to the last judgment because then everybody stopped thinking because they didn't know what they were going to do when they got to heaven. They knew what they were going to do in hell. <laughs> <laughs> and it's perfectly clear if you look at Jan van Eyck's painting of The Last Judgment in the Metropolitan Museum, a superb work of art. Everybody in heaven is completely bored. <laughs> They're sitting there looking like the cat that swallowed the canary rows and rows and rows of them and the Lord God Almighty is presiding and looking equally bored but down below there is a bat-winged skull <laughs> spreading out those ghastly wings and there are all nude bodies writhing and being eaten by snakes and chewing each other they're having an orgy <laughs> but all those stately people in heaven are uh, in church forever and that is the ultimate boredom <laughs> also observe Gustave Doré's illustrations of Dante's Divina Commedia uh, he was a magnificent engraver and while he's on the theme of the Inferno he is full of imagination in the Purgatorio, his imagination declines a little bit, and when he gets to the Paradiso, it's shot. Because all he has is ladies in white nighties trailing in circles through the skies. <laughs> you know, angels. 
And he has no idea what an angel is. The only man who really understands angels is an Austrian artist. Kubi. What? Kubi. Yeah. Who has fantastic imagination as to what an angel really looks like. So, uh, but they're very rare people who have, the Persian painters had a true vision of paradise. The Persian miniatures with their lovely gardens and jewel-like trees and uh, people sitting around uh, smoking hookahs and uh, observing the birds. They, they really had it. But it is extraordinary that our idea of, the, of paradise is weak. That's why I said earlier that uh, students should write about their idea of heaven and to get the imagination going. Well, anyway, the point is that we reach is, and that's never been admitted, is that heaven is the perfectly useless state. What is God for? What purpose is served by God? Obviously, none at all. I mean, imagine some use for God. It's inconceivable. Well, it's very useful. He lets us cop out of our responsibility. Our yes, but that again, you see, it returns to uselessness. Yeah. You see? Like everything like everything else. And uh, like children, when they're little and uh, wise, you know, they love it. And adults say, stop that! Behave yourself. <laughs> Be useful. Be purposive. So, but the universe is not. And here you see giraffes, hippopotamuses, uh, ferns. Uh, have you ever looked at um, high magnification of viruses? They're insane. <laughs> and uh, especially ra radiolaria, which you find in the depths of the Indian Ocean, are the most magnificent pieces of jewelry that you could ever conceive. They have in the New York Museum of Natural History glass models of these blown up to be so big. And you can't conceive anything so beautiful. There are tiaras, there are spheres with uh, spines coming out that look like, uh, you know, the thing you always wanted and that you want to give your best girlfriend as a Christmas present. Gorgeous things. Why is it, too, that when human beings want to symbolize the ultimate, they will almost invariably pick a flower? You get the rose windows of the great medieval cathedrals, you get the Buddhist lotuses, you get the mandalas. They are all floriform, stellar beings. We somehow look to the flower with more reverence than we look to the human face. That is odd. Because eyes are really, in my opinion, the world's most beautiful jewels. You look in somebody's eyes and really look. We always avoid eye contact in the ordinary way because they're taboo. But if you really got some friend and you can sit in front of them and look deep, deep, deep into the eyes, this is absolutely fascinating. But flowers are eyes. Iris. And the circularity of the eye is the same principle as the circularity of the flower. The color, the beauty, the depth, the transparency. My mother used to say, showing me a morning glory. Doesn't it make you feel jazzy inside? Interesting. We do that. So, 
The point is then that the music is life for its own sake. Where we're living in an eternal now, when we listen to music, we're not listening to the past, we're not listening to the future. We are listening to an expanded present. Because uh, to hear melody is to hear the interval between tones. If you can't hear the interval, you're tone deaf. So just as we have a field of vision which is so wide, so the present moment is not, as the clock indicates, a hairline. The present moment is a field of experience. which is not what we would call instantaneous. It's much more than that. So that within the present moment, we can hear intervals between tones and rhythms so that we get the feel of a sequence going on. So when I talk about the eternal now, please don't confuse it with a split second. It's not the same kind of thing. The eternal now is roomy, easy. Lots in it, rich. But frivolous. There's a wonderful tale that reminds me of there was a clergyman at Christ Church, Oxford, who had terribly bad handwriting. So bad he couldn't read it himself. And he was preaching a sermon. And he started out looking at his notes and said, <coughs> You who are frivolous, of course. <coughs> you who are frivolous, of course. <coughs> you who are followers of Christ. <laughs> but, 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 do, do you see the connection? <laughs> Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. Do not be anxious for the morrow. You who are frivolous, of course. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> and it, I told someone over lunch time that G.K. Chesterton said, angels fly because they take themselves lightly. <laughs> See? There is a divine frivolity. The love that moves the sun and other stars is frivolity. And God, therefore, might be described as being sincere but not serious. If I say, if some lady says to me, who's beautiful and attractive, and she says, I love you, and I say to her, are you serious or are you just playing with me? That's the wrong answer, because I hope she's not serious and that she will play with me. <laughs> so I should say to her, are you sincere or are you just toying with me? So that playfulness is the very essence of the energy of the universe. <laughs> See, that's what's happening. It's music. And bad music like written by Tchaikovsky, <laughs> it has a meaning, see? Good music, as written by Bach, has no meaning. Bach is just making marvelous patterns of sound. Whereas Tchaikovsky, with the 1812 overture, is imitating the noises of the Napoleon retreat from Moscow. And even, um, what's his name, Debussy, 
with this in glutted cathedral. You know, uh, is, is trying to represent with music something other than the music itself. But the classical music, whether it be of the West, of the Hindus, of the Chinese, has no other meaning than its own sound. Now, words, you see, have meaning. Words are noises, and they represent and point to something other than themselves in the same way as uh, dollar bills represent wealth, as maps represent territory, words represent something else. Water. The sound water will not make you wet. It's very important. You can't drink that noise. Water. Therefore, the word is symbolic and points to something other than itself. And so we say of words, they have meaning. Now, people get all fouled up because they want life to have meaning. As if it were words. You know, Goethe was hung up on this. Alles wer gänlich ist nie ein Gleichnis. All that is mortal is but a symbol. Of what? See? Confusing reality with words. What does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean? You know? ah, it's an insult to ask you what you mean. As if you had to have a meaning, as if you were a mere word, as if you were something that could be looked up in a dictionary. You are meaning. This is the point, you see. That the meaning, the goody about life, is exactly here and now. We are not going anywhere. Could you get this point of view? Go look out in the street and you will see people frantically thinking they're going somewhere, that they have important business. And they have a far out look in their eyes and their noses stick way out in front. And they are going somewhere. They are on purpose. They have something to achieve. Here and now, sitting around here, you realize we don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're in a way a captive audience. But we don't have to go anywhere at all with this here. And this is where it's at. That's why the Hindus call the true self of us all the Atman. The man where it's at. That's a terrible pun. Scholars are be horrified. <laughs> tell you another one. <laughs> there is a being in Buddhist uh, iconography called Avalokiteshvara, who is also known as Kanon in Japanese and Kuan Yin in Chinese, <coughs> Chen Rezi in Tibetan. And this is usually interpreted as the goddess of mercy. <coughs> she is represented with 1,000 arms, all radiating because she is the cosmic millipede and the embodiment of compassion. However, she is not completely a she. She is hermaphroditic, male-female, Avalokiteshvara. And Avalokiteshvara means the watchful lord, the one who is always caring and you can remember it because, as the Cockneys say, have a look it. <laughs> and there it is. Beautiful. <laughs> Take a look at it. Have a look it. It's Cockney. Language is simply fascinating. We could go into this and play all kinds of games with, the, with words and their music and magic. But now, here is the, the, the thing that we're getting at, is that <clears throat> a culture which excludes frivolity has lost the point of life. 
And this is where the Chinese communists are in extreme danger. They are the most earnest, uh, dedicated to survival. They were in an awful mess and it probably had to happen. But the style of life in China and also in Russia is drab because they think that the point of life is to go on living. And so long as you get by, no matter how horrible the food is, how drab your dress, you're getting by. And this is completely missing the point. What do you think that's true about the Chinese? My spies inform me. <laughs> <laughs> I think they still have good food if you're a commissar. No, that's true either. I think there's plenty of good food around for all. And I don't think that all the I have to go there to be. I have to go there to be persuaded. But uh, when I look at Mr. Mao Zedong, even Zhou Enlai, who's obviously a fellow of enormous competence and brains. I wish they'd use more imagination. We were talking about this just before we broke up with this gentleman here, and I said I'd seen all the films I'd seen on communist China. The thing that impressed me the most was there was no humor. That's the trouble. The, the mistake is on page 224 of Mao Zedong's Red Book. <laughs> now, I tell you exactly. No, no. no I tell you the mistake where he says it is essential to have a furrowed brow to think. And there is the error I pointed out this morning. To think that straining the muscles of the forehead has anything to do with clear thinking. That is against Lao Tzu, who is the greatest of all the Chinese philosophers, the father of wisdom, and so Mao Zedong says, you must have a furrowed brow. See, there's a the little slip there. I, I, no, look, my dear, I don't want to pick an argue with an argument with you because you're beautiful. <laughs> and, uh, you are so naturally without any effort. See? <laughs> without a furrowed brow. <laughs> See, nature does it. <laughs> No, but it is really basic to our uh, psychophysical function. You cannot make, make your mind, your nervous system, efficient by straining. See? So he makes that mistake. And that indicates an excess of seriousness. This is the point we're getting at, see? That... Life is not worth living if it is compulsive. Then why do so many people do that? I mean, when you said at the beginning something about the big question is whether to commit suicide or not, mm -hmm. well, the vast majority of people don't commit suicide. No. Why? Because... Well, you, the, the, the answer to that question isn't simple. You have to answer it in, in, a, in a kind of uh, double way. The vast majority of people could be said not to commit suicide. A, some of them enjoy going on. Some. Yes. Some of them are terrified of committing suicide, of death, and feel, therefore, they must go on. That it's, it, it is an absolute necessity to go on as long as possible. While there is life, there is hope. That's a terrible motto. But uh, some of us like to go on simply because we're enjoying the dance. Even if we are not very rich and uh, live in a fairly simple way, nevertheless, uh, the companionship with other people, the sight of the sun, 
the stars, the grasses, the sound of water, is its own explanation. As haiku poem says, the long night, the sound of the water says what I think. And therein we have this thing, which I'm trying to describe as play. Play in Sanskrit is lila. Lila is our word lilt. And the universe is called Vishnu Lila. The sport or play of Vishnu. And we can go into that very deeply because when we talk about the play, we also talk about the theatre. And uh, the theatre is a very curious phenomenon because it is defined by a stage in a proscenium arch. And behind the scenes is a green room. Is it what? Green room, where the actors dress up. And they know who they are in reality before they assume their persona. The word persona means a mask that through which sound passes, per, sona, because the masks worn in the open-air theatre of Greco-Roman drama had megaphonic mouthpieces so that the sound would be projected in, uh, out of doors. So the person is the fake. Your personality is your image of yourself, which is not you at all. Is your mask. So the actors come on and the, the, the strategy is that the actors want to convince the audience that it's real, what's happening on the stage. The audience knows by virtue of the proscenium arch and the kind of uh, fencing off of the stage from the spectators that what is going on on the stage is not really for real. That the actors are going to act so well they're going to have people weeping, laughing, crying, sitting on the edge of their seats in anxiety because they've almost persuaded that this show is for real. Now imagine pushing this to a far extreme. The very finest actors with the most appreciative audience. And here we are. <laughs> See, we believe it's real. And it's a play. And we take it seriously. And therefore, because we take it seriously and we don't see through, we kill each other and are mean to each other and we exploit each other. And for no real reason whatsoever. If we understood we saw through that and we knew that this whole life was a joke after all what is the joker in the deck of cards the wild card that can play any role the joker is the symbol of God in the pack therefore kings in ancient times would always have a jester at court and what was the jester the man who was crazy He was a schizophrenic who would make unpredictable remarks. And everybody roared with laughter because he said things out of context. (laughs) Schizophrenics basically are, in a way, liberated people because they don't give a damn. You get a schizophrenic child and the schizophrenic child doesn't care whether he's knocked down by a car or... Whatever happens, happens. No boss said, oh, mustn't do that. You're valuable. We must preserve you. This child doesn't care. I said, Bleh. <laughs> <laughs> so they got these schizophrenics who were funny people. And they sat at the foot of the king's throne to remind the king not to take himself seriously. He 
you know in Richard II. Within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his watch. And there the antic sits, the antic means the jester, there the antic sits, scoffing at his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a little space to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks. And then at the last comes death, and with a little pin bores through his castle wall, and farewell king. You know, Shakespeare is full of this kind of wisdom of uh, the transients of life. Our revels now are ended, and these our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits, and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the solemn temples, the glorious palaces, the great earth itself, I all which inherit shall dissolve like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Whew. See, the most fantastic things in poetry work on the theme of insubstantiality, of transience. It's all fading away. Everything, we, we, we are, each one of us, not a substantial entity, but we are like a flame. And a flame is a stream of hot gas. Like a whirlpool in a river. Every one of us is a, a flowing. Now, if you resist that, you go crazy. You're like somebody trying to grab water in your hands. And the harder you squeeze it, the faster it slips through your fingers. So the, the principle of the enjoyment of life is this is not a precept, this is nothing to do with moralization, <coughs> has nothing to do with uh, what you ought, should, etc. It is completely practical. Don't hang on to it. Let it go. <laughs>